Let us pray. Dear God, we ask you for your spirit to lead us and open our hearts and imaginations so we can receive your word, the word that became flesh and dwell among us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think Christina has preached for today. We can just say the benediction and go back home. <laughs> but if I do that, I might be fired because I need to preach. So I will try to echo what Christina said because that is what I've written down to preach today. So we live in a world where in almost everything we need to do, there is an application form that we need to fill in. Application form for employment, application form for passports, application form for birth certificate, application for ID, application for certain benefit, in all those applications that we need to fill in, there are check boxes, such as male or female, that you need to check. Military service, yes or no, you need to check. Color of your hair, US citizen, or non-U.S. citizen, you need to check. Veterans, yes or no, you need to check. Convicted of any felony, yes or not, you need to check. Race, you need to check white, black, African-American, Hispanic, American Indian, or Alaska Native. The list goes on and on. If you come to my country, you realize that there is they, even where you need to check about your tribe, about your chieftaincy, who's your chief. There are a lot of stuff that you need to check while you are doing an application form. But the question is, how much of those check boxes say about who we really are? How much of those check boxes capture the image of God to whom we were created? Is who we are more concerned or connected to our physical appearance? Or there is more than just what we see? Our text this morning says Jesus looked at his disciples in a moment of reflection and he asked them, who do people say the son of man is? And later on, still in his reflective moment, Jesus then asked his disciple, but you, who do you say I am? Was there a problem of identity crisis for Jesus, for Jesus to ask that question? Was Jesus trying to know the check boxes people have chosen in his application for the Messiah's position? What would be the answer if Jesus could come here this morning and say, who do you think I am? Or what a people in your neighborhood say I am. What will be our answers? I think these are two interesting questions. But the first one is easy. Because Jesus is asking the disciple to tell him what other people are saying. It's easy to, to answer to that question. And I think they were just answering one by one saying i heard this one saying you are this i heard that one saying you are that but the second one is a 
is more of a personal question. But you, who do you say I am? And when you look at these two questions, they lead us to a third question, which says, what have we done with the information revealed to us about Jesus as church? What have we done with that revelation of who Jesus is? So let us start with the first question. Who do people say the Son of Man is? In modern world, the answer to the question, who do people say I am, will be concentrated more on physical appearance. They will answer you are male or female. They will answer that you are tall or you are short. They will answer that you are white, Hispanic, or black. They will answer that you are poor or you are rich. They will answer according to the prestigious university that you have attended. They will answer in a way that it only shows the appearance. Isn't that is how we de describe people? By what we see. And mostly by the things that makes us different to other people. That is how we describe them. But listen to what this report from the disciples says. The first one they said, Jesus is highly venerated personality in the religious life of the Hebrew people. That is who Elijah was. So they say, yeah, we think this man is Elijah. The man who defeated 450 prophets of Baal. The worker of miracles who is expected to reappear before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. As Malachi 4.5 tells us. That was the first box that they ticked. It's a highly venerated personality. Then they say, no, some are saying, you are a powerful preacher who confronted the authority that John the Baptist. You remember that John the Baptist's career was cut short when he confronted Herod Antipas for sleeping with his brother's wife. Herod had John beheaded. But John's death made him to become even more popular among people. And it, in, it is interesting that Herod himself believed that Jesus was the John the Baptist reincarnated. He thought John had come back to get him. And when you read Matthew 14.1, it reads, When Herod heard of Jesus, he said to his servant, This is John the Baptist who have been raised from the dead and that is why these great powers are at work in him a great preacher then some are said some are saying you are a prophet a prophet who predicted the destruction of jerusalem and the temple jeremiah Jeremiah was an important figure in the history of the Hebrew people since they believed that Jeremiah had secretly gone into the ark and removed the altar of incense and eaten it somewhere else. The ark was an important thing and it represented God. When you look at these three different descriptions of Jesus, None of them is connected to Jesus' physical appearance. But that was not enough. Then Jesus said, now I'm going to ask you a very difficult question. But you, who do you say I am? After hearing all the compliments, Jesus then turned to his disciples and asked them a more personal question. A question which is theologically relevant, not only to the 12 apostles, but 
even to us today. Who do you say I am? This question is relevant to us this morning. It is a question that confronts our daily reality. Who do you say I am? What will be your answer this morning? My dear brothers and sisters, what will be your answer this morning to that question of who do you say I am when Jesus is standing before you and asks you that question? The Bible have tried to answer to that question with the following attribute. Some are saying Jesus is Lord. Some are saying Jesus is the Savior. Some are saying Jesus is the light, the way, and the truth, the Messiah, the Son of Man, the Redeemer. But what are you saying he is this morning to you? Who is Jesus to you? What are the checking boxes you are going to select? If they ask you to describe Jesus this morning. Simon Peter stood up and said, I know who you are. You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. You see, God's revelation cannot be contained in check boxes. It cannot be described by any physical appearance. God's revelation is too big to be contained in our human ways of describing things and people. God's revelation is powerful. Elijah received revelation from God. John the Baptist received revel revelation from God. Jeremiah had received re revelation from God. And people were tormented to hear those revelations from God. And so they decided To kill these people so that God's revelation could also die. But God's revelation is so powerful that it can never die. So this leads me to my last point. What are we doing with that revelation? What are we doing with that powerful revelation of God? I invite us not to focus on how gospel writers have described Jesus. But I invite us this morning to concentrate on who is really Jesus to us. Who is really Jesus to me? Who is really Jesus to you? What has the Holy Spirit revealed to you about Jesus? I met a brother and a friend in St. Louis, Missouri by the name of Jim. He's a son of a former United Methodist pastor who was a missionary in Bolivia for many years. Jim attended University United Methodist Church in St. Louis. University United Methodist Church is surrounded by universities and seminaries. There is Washington University, there is St. Louis University, there is Fort Bonn University, there is Concordia Seminary, there is Eden Theological Seminary, there is the St. Louis School of Pharmacy not far from there. And most of the people who come to that church, some of them are professors, some of them they work at those institutions, some of them they, they, they are very important people in the community. But Jim was also... Jim is also part of that church. And Jim struggled with some mental issues. Sometimes he will come to me and say, this week was not good for me. I didn't succeed on doing what the Lord has asked me to do. But one thing he always does, he will come very early in the morning on Sunday and 
He will go in the room where we used to have adult Sunday school. He will prepare the room. And he's going to welcome everyone who will be coming in that room that morning. And after that, he's going to disappear. So I started getting worried and say, why is this man not attending to these Sunday school classes? I said, maybe people have offended him. That is why he doesn't want to be here. I said, maybe he's intimidated by these professors and all these big personalities. That is why he doesn't want to be here. But one day, I decided to follow him and have a conversation with him. So I went out to look for him. I went to the main door of the church. He was not there. I went to the second, to the next door. When I opened the door and I looked, there was Jim waving at each and every car that was passing by and each and every car that was going into the parking lot of the church. He was not only waving at them, but he was saying, you are a child of God and God loves you. The next car pass, you are a child of God and God loves you. I was standing there. I started shaking. What a powerful revelation. He looked at saying and saying, what you guys are doing in that Sunday school class is important, but I have a revelation from God to share with the people on the street. And he was doing that each and every Sunday. You will see him up there waving. That kind of revelation is powerful. There's no checking box that can be put on any application when it comes to that kind of revelation. A revelation of, of your own experience with Jesus. One of my favorite theologians is born Arthur. He's a German. He had God's revelation of who Jesus is. The Spirit had revealed to him that Jesus is the man for others. He struggled with that revelation. He was like a pregnant woman who was about to give birth, but he didn't know what to do with that revelation. He struggled to understand the revelation which says Jesus is the man for others. He came to the United States at Union Theological Seminary in New York to try and figure out that revelation from God. Unfortunately, he was disappointed by American the theologies of that time when he came to America. So he returned to German and continued struggling with that re revelation of Jesus is the man for others. Elijah, John the Baptist, or Jeremiah, all were people who had revelation from God, and those revelations did put them in trouble. Martin Luther King Jr. had a revelation from God. Which revelation did put him in trouble up to death? Nelson Mandela had a revelation of a rainbow nation which cost him 27 years in prison. Bon Arthur had a revelation which landed him in concentration camp in Germany where he was killed. But in all these, God's revelation cannot die. People can die, but what God has put in them will never die. So what is that revelation that God has put in you about Jesus? My dear friends and brothers and sisters, God is still speaking. I like that when you go to a United Church of Christ church, they always say, God is speaking, and they put a comma, not a period. Meaning that the revelation of God are there every day, so don't put a stop. The Holy Spirit 
is at work in you every day, revealing great stuff, revealing powerful stuff. And these texts this morning invite us to pay attention to those revelations from God. Revelation that are more important for us and for people around us. And they let us make mankind to our own image that we found in Genesis is the greatest and the powerful revelation from God. This revelation does not check boxes. It is a great and powerful revelation which leads us to one important thing. And that important thing is we are all children of God. As we are approaching elections, whether you have received a revelation of being red or being blue, whether you are still praying for God to reveal to you which side to go, remember, remember one important thing. You are a child of God. Remember that important thing that you are a child of God. And as a child of God, whatever you choose to do during these elections, let people see that you are a child of God. Let people see that image of God in you. Jesus looked at Simon Peter and said, don't boost yourself, man. It's not you. Who is saying this? It's the Spirit of God which has revealed this to you. So the good news this morning is that that same Spirit of God is still speaking. It's still speaking in you. It's still speaking in your children. It's still speaking in the people around you. Let us just pay attention to hear what God is saying to us. About us. About our neighborhood. About this nation, and about this world. May God bless us. Amen.